Um, and first off, if I can ask everybody just to make sure that all their electronic devices are on silent mode. Right, agenda item one is a decision on taking uh, business in private. Um, agenda item four, uh, on consideration of the evidence heard, are members agreed to take that in private? Agreed. Agreed. Moving on to agenda item two, uh, is evidence on Audit Scotland's spring budget revision for 2017-18. Now, members have a, a copy of the proposed spring budget revision in their meeting papers, and I'd like to welcome to the meeting Ian Leach, Chair of the Board of Audit Scotland, and Ian's accompanied by Caroline Gardner, of course, the Auditor General for Scotland, Diane McGiffin, Chief Operating Officer, and Russell Frith, Assistant Auditor General. Now, I understand this is a big day for Russell because this is the last time we're going to see him in front of us. He's, <coughs> he's retiring. And uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity, Russell, to thank you for all the support and everything you've given the Commission over the years and uh, to wish you well in the retirement to come. Thank you very much. It's been... Um Mainly a pleasure Atten <laughs> att attending. I, th I think I've only missed one or possibly two of the SCPA meetings since it uh, actually started. So, uh, yes, I, I, I will miss it. We'll this is his last official engagement. After this meeting is concluded, he doesn't go back to the office. He's going home. He's retired. So this really? is his last outing. I thought, just the record, and the Board of Audit Scotland are extremely grateful to him for his assistance. On the other hand, a plea in mitigation in advance. Since he's the mob happy, we need to be careful what he says. <laughs> well, we've no time constraints on today's meeting, so we'll make it worth his while to be here. Anyway, um, can I start by asking the Auditor General to make a, a short introductory statement, uh, perhaps a few minutes? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll focus, if I may, on the spring budget revision initially, um, and we can move on to the next agenda item when you're ready. Um, as you know, our spring budget proposal requests £2.826 million to meet a non-cash pension accounting charge that will arise as a result of accounting adjustments in 2017-18. The request relates solely to pension adjustments. We're not able to plan for these due to the timing of the information that we receive from our actuaries, and the Scottish Government has asked us to deal with them through the spring budget revision process. It's worth emphasising that these accounting adjustments are notional and don't generate cash movements. As you know, Chair, these, this area tends to be complicated, but we'll do our best to answer questions that you and the com Commission may have, um, and we'll leave it there at this point. <coughs> Thank you. Um, perhaps I can begin by just having a look at the, uh, the individual amount that you've got here. Can you confirm you've had, you've had preliminary discussions with the uh, Scottish Government <coughs> to confirm that the previously agreed arrangements with HM Treasury remain in place? And have you advised them of the amount of Audit Scotland's requirement? Yes, to both, Chair. In that case, I'll throw it open to members if they've got any comments. Anything you'd like to ask on this particular issue? No? In that case, can I ask members if they're content to agree the spring budget revision 2017-18? Agreed. Thank you. And we'll write to the Finance and Constitution Committee to inform them of our decision. I'd like to move on to agenda item three, which is the budget proposal for 2018-19. Um, taking evidence on Audit Scotland's budget proposal. Members have a copy of the budget proposal in the meeting papers. We, we have the same witnesses for this agenda item. And therefore, I would just like to firstly invite the chair of the board, Ian Leach, to make a short introductory statement, perhaps five minutes, followed by the Auditor General. Ian? Uh, chair, I'll be less than that, because you have our budget proposals before you. Uh, as you are aware, conveners, as indeed your members are, this is a time of real change for Scotland's public finances as further powers are devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Our priority in Audit Scotland is to ensure that the high quality audit work carried out continues across the piece and that the organisation is sufficiently resourced to take on these challenges. Our budget proposal supports the goal by identifying resources to carry out new work, as detailed in our submission. 
as well as providing support to Parliament in its scrutiny of what will become an increasingly complex financial picture. While some aspects of these changes are still unknown, for example, the impact of Brexit, there are other areas where we know are what will increase, such as the creation of new bodies and the transfer of powers. And our estimate of resources in these areas is based on our experience. <clears throat> what continues on the implications of the UK leaving the European Union, but at this stage, the impact on audit work cannot be quantified, and our budget proposal makes no specific allowance for these, these changes which may occur. This is an area we are keeping under review and we hope to be able to respond flexibly where necessary. In terms of audit fees, our budget proposal for 1819 will continue to deliver real reductions in fees while maintaining the quality of our work. And if I may, Chair, I'll hand over to Caroline Gardner in her capacity as Accountable Officer to give you her opening view on the budget proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, our budget proposal does reflect significant change in um, financial powers and workload for the Parliament. Um, the overall revenue resource requirement from the Scottish Consolidated Fund for 2018-19 is £7.148 million, which represents an increase of £617,000 from 2017-18, the current financial year. The main factors in this are work that's associated with the new financial powers coming to the Scottish Parliament and the Biennial National Fraud Initiative, which, as you know, produces a peak every other year. And we anticipate that and additional capacity will need to be phased in over the next four years um, for the new financial powers as they come on stream. Overall, the additional resources will enable us to carry out new work, which includes assurance to the Parliament as the financial and social security powers in the Scotland Act 2016 are implemented, further work su supporting Parliament as the complexity of the Scottish finances and the links to economic performance increase, the audit of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, where legislation doesn't allow us to charge a fee for the audit, work with the National Audit Office to provide assurance on income tax and, in due course, VAT income, and the audit of further taxes and Social Security as these are devolved. As ever, Chair, we're happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I suppose the most significant aspect to this is the additional posts. That's, that's where the money is. Um, your 9.4% increase in cash terms is uh, very substantial, given the austerity that we're in at the moment. Um, assuming that not all the new posts will be filled on 1st April 2018, can you confirm that the total additional funding takes into account assumptions on phase start dates for the new staff? Yes, Chair, certainly. Um, it's worth um, unpicking a bit, I think, the uh, people and the movements behind the numbers. We estimate that in 2018-19, the total cost of doing the work will be about £667,000. That does incorporate an element of phasing over the year. Um, we have actually started to work up towards um, the full capacity that we want in 1819 already by using efficiencies within our existing budget for this year. Um, so, for example, we've recruited a small number of additional professional trainees during the appointment round that we've just been through. Um, and as you'll see from the four-year projections at the back of the proposal, we expect that to build up across the piece. So we have factored in the fact that we won't have everybody in place and fully operational on the 1st of, of um, April. And in fact, we are bringing some of the costs forward into 1718 um, to, to use the flexibility we're building into our budget um, during the year. What are, what are you estimating the, the full year cost of these additional posts will be? Diane, can I ask you to take the Commission through the detail of that? Um, <clears throat> I think the full year costs um, are um, presented in the um, as a net a net additional cost in the proposal because we have um, looked closely at our um, model of resourcing and the portfolio of work we have with the Scottish Government and Central Government sector and generated efficiencies in how we work in pu in pulling together our um, our teams who'll be working there. So um, the um, additional funding requirement is around 380,000 and the full cost of the work is um, is around 660,000 but we have in, um, introduced efficiencies in how we've planned to adjust the focus of the teams um, to um, 
take some of their current work and apply some of the work that will be necessary for new financial powers. 267,000 is the annual cost of the eight posts. It would be the annual cost, um, but we have reduced that by delivering efficiencies. Um, so the, the amount for the new post is reduced to um, 380,000. But you're saying in the uh, in your budget documents here that the full additional resource required by 2021-22 is 20 staff at a cost of 1.2 million. Um, explain the um, rationale behind that. The planning that we've done for new financial powers has been based on modelling which looks at um, a, a low point, a high point and a midpoint. So for now the most um, prudent assessment that we can make is based on the mid-range of those assumptions. This year, the budget that you're considering today is the largest single growth, um, an estimate of about eight full-time equivalent posts. <laughs> And in each of the subsequent three years, we'd be looking at an additional four posts if our mid-range assumptions hold true. Um, we'll be revisiting those assumptions um, continually throughout the years, particularly as the exact timetable for rolling out new financial powers um, uh, transpires. And we will be revisiting annually with you um, how those assumptions are holding up or not. We've explicitly and in discussion with the board pitched our bid at the mid-range assumption because at the moment although we can be very certain about a lot of the work there are still some uncertainties and a need for flexibility and we anticipate that the need for flexibility will continue uh, for a few years to come alongside all of this work as um, the chair mentioned we're also having to think through what the implications of Brexit uh, will mean for us downstream, and that's one of the reason why one of the reasons why we intend to um, actively monitor the resource requirements we have, and be in active dialogue with you as a commission as these um, as these transpire. You've indicated in the past that there were recruitment issues. Um, have you taken these into account? And uh, are you fully confident that you'll be able to recruit at the salaries you're talking about the correct uh, the correct uh, spread of skills and so on? We are um, we are confident at the moment. We have um, good data on our recruitment for this year. We have um, recently, um, you'll know from our um, report to you on our annual report and accounts. We have revised our. Um, roles, pay structure, grading structure, and created an attractive proposition for uh, people joining the organisation <coughs> that focuses on the opportunities for career development. And at the moment, that is um, working well for us in the market, and it's also something we'll keep under review. I think um, we are conscious of some hotspots for skills, and we need to be able to respond to that. That's something that we um, have an active discussion with our, the remuneration Spots. committee. Um, generally around data and IT skills. Um, and I think as we move into more data data analytics and use of econometrics and so on, we'll be in competition um, with other employers there. So our focus as an employer has been on providing a good career opportunity in the round. When you're talking about uh, data there, are you meaning techies? People with, um, with, with uh, skills in specifically in re relation to IT? Um, both IT skills and also in the use of data and the presentation of data and in analysing data. Um, one of the areas of development for us has been in our audit intelligence work where we're looking at providing our auditors with um, really good analysis using up-to-date data across the portfolio of work to... Um, to free them up to focus on adding value through the work. And we also support our performance audit um, work through the data analytics project. So there's a mix of both sets of skills. I mean, we're talking about 2018-19 here. Um, by, you're saying by 2021-22, the staff costs will have risen to 1.2 million over where we are now. So what's that missing year? What, what's the progression through that? I mean, we're, talking, we're only talking in three years' time. So we're talking about eight posts in this year, at, at, at a mid-range estimate, eight posts in this year, which is the largest step change, and four posts in each of the subsequent years, if the assumptions we're working with just now hold true. Are you satisfied that uh, at this level of resourcing, I mean, there, there's 
huge pressures happening everywhere within within the audit sphere with additional powers coming down and so on. Have you covered also the needs of the Accounts Commission in terms of anything additional that they may have to tackle as a result? I don't know if there is. I'm just saying, has um, it been considered? One of the strengths, I think, of the um, model of public audit that we have is that Audit Scotland is the single agency providing um, resources to the um, Auditor General and the Accounts Commission. And we are able to plan um, the deployment of our um, skilled people across different portfolios of work. So the budget we <coughs> have before you takes into account the new financial powers work and also the ongoing delivery of the recently revised best value approach in local government, as well as the core financial work and the programme of performance audit work. We have a model in um, deploying uh, colleagues on work to extend their experience and skills and to give them a range of opportunities so that we um, we build strength in the skills and experience that people have. The, the plans you have before you are based on um, delivering all of the work that's outlined in the budget proposal. Now, you've emphasised the fact that uh, the figures you're giving are sort of mid-range. What's, what's the top end of the range here? Um, the top end of the range would be, um, I think, um, going up to... Um, possibly in future years, um, rather than four um, full-time equivalents, um, possibly as much as double that. But at the moment, we'd rather um, base our plans on the mid-range, which we have built up, taking into account all our accumulated knowledge of the resources that are required to go into auditing these types of things, and also the development capacity that we need to respond to the fast-changing policy environment. Alison. Um, thank you, convener. Excuse me a second. Um, I'd like to ask about pay policy. Um, on page 8 of your budget proposal, Audit Scotland has assumed a 1% increase in its pay scales from, from next April and a corresponding uplift of 1% in the fees that are paid to the audit firms that you appoint to work on your behalf. Um, the Scottish Government, in their draft budget, um, you'll be aware, state that they guarantee a minimum 3% pay increase to public sector workers earning £30,000 or less and an increase of 2% for those earning more than £30,000. Um, if pay awards in the public sector in Scotland generally exceed 1%, does Audit Scotland plan to revisit budget proposals? Um, it's worth um, emphasising for the committee that our budget proposal was submitted before the budget last week and before the um, pay policy was published. Uh, we've prepared it on the assumption, as we say in the paper, of a 1% uplift in pay scales and a 1% inflation cost. So there's 2% built in as an assumption across the piece. Um, with the figures you have in front of you. We've started modelling what the pay policy that was published last week will mean for us, and I think we're waiting for some more detail on how it applies specifically. Um, but it will depend on the makeup of individual workforces, and I think Diane would like to add a little bit of detail to that for you. We're due to go into negotiation with our trade union um, in the new year, and both they and we will be looking closely at the technical guidance which will come out from the Scottish Government um, in January, I think. And we'll be looking um, closely as we go into the negotiations at how we can um, respond to what, from the PCS point of view, our recognised trade union and for um, our wider group of colleagues is a welcome um, movement on pay policy, but also recognising that we have to do the right thing by our colleagues, our stakeholders and our clients. So we'll be going into the negotiations with the trade unions um, on the basis of this budget and looking at the long, longer term fees and funding um, options available to us and efficiency options to respond to the, um, the opportunities presented by what will come in the detailed technical guidance. So um, we're going into the negotiations in the new year with all of that as the backdrop. Thank you. Can I ask, is the planned 1% or, or whatever increase it is in fees <coughs> to, appoint, to appointed audited firms, is that a contractual requirement? Do you want yes. to pick that yes. up? Uh, yes, it is. When we uh, put out the tender documents, uh, we were clear that the prices the firms were bidding were on the basis that they would receive increases during the course of the five-year contract equal to the base pay increase for Audit Scotland staff. 
So in this case, the assumption here, 1%. And 1% in for the firms is equivalent to just under £40,000 a year. Can I ask about the cost implications of a higher pay award and a higher increase in fees paid to appointed auditors, assuming that these are linked? As Russell said, an, an additional 1% over and above what we've assumed in the budget is £41,000. For our staff, we estimate at the moment that a further 1% would be the equivalent of about £150,000. Um, so it would have a significant impact um, in the overall budget envelope that we've got. But as Diane said, we would look to negotiate with our um, partners in PCS um, a package, as we have done in the past, that balances the interests of staff with the value for money that we're able to offer to the public purse. Thank you. Can I ask if you're aware of the salary ratio between the highest and lowest paid staff members within Audit Scotland? Russell will check the exact figure. I think it's about four and a half times. Okay, thank you. And do you monitor that closely and take any steps to, to close that gap? Diane, annually in our annual report and accounts. And we um, consistently over the past few years have um, geared our pay settlements to increase the lower paid um, salaries that we have and particularly for us um, increase the graduate trainee um, skills, pay skills that we have. We are an accredited living wage employer and we um, have also extended that to contracts that we have um, for some of the services that we buy um, and we have um, consistently with our PCS partners looked at opportunities to um, gear our um, pay and reward system to improve the pay for lower paid staff. Thank you. Just Thank you. Follow up on that. At the disclosure in our accounts to March 17 was that the multiple between the median salary, which is the one that's required to be disclosed, and the highest one was 3.4 times. Bill, you wanted to come in on the back just of that. <clears throat> a couple of things, just to go back to what we were speaking about before. How much overtime do your staff work? Uh, two parts to that question. I think um, people work the hours required to do the job, but in general we don't pay for overtime except in specific circumstances that Diane can talk you through. <coughs> Generally, the only specific circumstances where we pay for overtime are with our IT colleagues who work out of hours to maintain our services or to um, apply new systems and so on. So have you built that over time, however it is, not the IT one, into your requirement for more staff? Um, yeah, the requirement for, we've not built an overtime requirement, but the requirements for um, new staff are built on our knowledge of what our um, model of resourcing teams delivers, the amount of hours that they are available for, the training and development requirements that they have across the different levels and skill mix that we have. So there's a very detailed picture um, that leads up to the budget proposal that we delivered to you. Okay. And on the, the pay, what is your gender pay gap? Diane. I, uh, we, don't, um, we don't report a gender pay gap um, significantly. And I can come back to you on that. We analyse the um, we analyse the um, a whole range of statistics on gender equality, um, on pay, on um, access to learning and development, on part time contracts, um, and so on. We have reviewed our pay system and implemented a new pay system. It was the subject of an equality impact assessment and um, proven to be sound. There are, there are no differences in our um, gender pay that aren't explained by virtue of issues other than gender. So you will be able to produce the gender pay gap? We have produced um, an annual um, equality report which is available and I can forward that on to the Commission if you would like and we produce that annually. And Does that have the gender pay gap in it? It has. It reports on pay, yep. Is, is that, yes, it's got yes, the gender pay yes. gap, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. But we, um, we have a robust pay system which has been the subject of an equality impact assessment and shows that there aren't differences that are arising in the outcomes because of gender, the differences are any differences there are, which we examine annually and report to the remuneration committee on are the result of factors other than gender. So we are in a um, a good place. Well I look forward to seeing that.
report. Rona. Thank you. Convener, good morning. Um, can I go back to recruitment um, just briefly? You talked about attracting people with the technical skills um, to update your um, data and <laughs> analytics. Um, can you give me an idea of, well, A, if you think you can attract those people, and B, how long will it take for them to update the, the data and anal analytics in, in a broad sense? Um, if I may, we already have um, colleagues on board um, who have been working on our data analytics project for a while and we have also been extending the network of colleagues inside the organisation who have an interest or aptitude for data analytics and investing in learning and development for them so that we're trying to strengthen our resilience in this area and our ability to deploy data analytic tools in audit work. Um, we're currently recruiting for um, an IT member of the team. I don't have the results in for that yet, but we can report back on that. The IT market is very fast moving, so sometimes the data we have from the last time we were in the market isn't entirely a predictor of what will happen next time we're in the market. We've had good success in bringing in some secondments with relevant experience who've helped develop the skills of the team and we'll be um, using our extensive network of, um, with um, further and higher education, other bodies and so on, to advertise recruitment. And we'll be specifically targeting um, our recruitment <coughs> campaigns in the, right, um, in the right areas. We're fortunate in that Audit Scotland, as an employer brand, um, is strong for people who want to work in finance in the public sector. And we have to work hard to maintain a, a really good offering for colleagues in the round. Um, one of the things that is greatly valued, we know, by our existing colleagues is um, work-life balance and flexibility. And we have to make sure that what we're offering in employment terms is valuable um, in the round to people and that we offer a range of um, options and opportunities. We're particularly focused on career development and giving people the op option to come and work with us and develop their skills and experience. And this year, as well as in, in um, recruiting an enhanced number of graduate trainees, we've taken on our first school leaver to offer entry into the accountancy profession from a school leaver point of view. And over the years, we hope to develop that as a um, an additional, albeit small, route for people into the accounting profession. Thank you, that's just so. Can I just change tack a wee bit and ask you um, about your capacity to deal with the sort of changing nature of work and your obvious increased wor workload, and I'm thinking particularly the great uncertainty of Brexit and the new financial powers. Can I ask about your capacity, if you feel confident that you, you, know, you are actually you do have the plans and the, you will have the staff in place to deal with all that? On financial powers, <coughs> I think that's been set out here, the, the additional powers, although there's some uncertainty and we've built it. The Brexit one is more troublesome, uh, frankly, because we don't know what we don't know, but we've still got, and I've used the word before when addressing this commission, it's all about preparedness. We are trying to work, and we have a team working on this, on, a, on certain assumptions about Brexit. What will it mean? Where will the cost lie? What will the cost be? What will Westminster devolve further to the Scottish Parliament? What will come directly to the Scottish Parliament when we Brexit? There's a degree of uncertainty, a considerable degree of uncertainty. That's the area which is soft. On the first part of your question, I think we've set out, and Diane has answered what we think we need next year and where we're going with the financial powers. We don't want to make any figures, and that's why I said in my opening remarks, we haven't made any provision in that sense for what Brexit will be because we're still working this preparedness. Not just our own preparedness, we've got to anticipate to some degree the extent of the bodies we audit, their preparedness and how they're geared up for it, and it's extremely difficult. But this is one of our priorities and one of the things we're going to almost a think tank in the office working on, and it's a subject at every board meeting which is addressed. I cannot say we've got a definitive answer. If we had, then I think I'd go and buy some brick coins 10 years ago, but not today. They're too pricey. But that's the thing we're working on, and it's really, really difficult. Crystal um, Ball, but, I mean, have you got a kind of worst-case scenario in terms of, like, you know, this is, you know, if, if this happens and if this happens, and it might sound extreme, can we cope with it? On financial powers, we've dealt with that. On Brexit... 
Well, I'm, I'm thinking about Brexit. Actually. Brexit. Yeah. Specifically, we don't have a worst-case scenario because we don't know what we don't know. Uh, and if we, if we were to simply pluck a worst-case scenario out of the air, it would mean cost. And how do you how do you put a figure on that? I think we have to take this bit by bit. The Commission has questioned us on this in the past, and rightly so. It's a question we ask ourselves constantly. We have made provision in our budget for uh, looking at and seeing where Brexit is going. But frankly, until the powers that be, uh, with respect, and this is not a political point, know where they're going, we cannot be assumed to know where they're going. So it could come as a, a bit of a, a disaster scenario, uh, in which case of a big hike in budgets. We think that's unlikely. Uh, the way things are going, there is talk of a transition period which allows for some degree of planning for the audit implications, which is our interest in this matter, not just from our, our preparedness, but for the other side, the government's preparedness to deal with the financial aspects of what they will be getting and our ability to audit it. So we're conscious of the big issues, but we're not conscious of the specific answers. Okay. Sure. We're trying to take the same approach, as the Chair has said, to the approach we've taken to new financial power since 2012, when the first Scotland Act was passed, which is to invest our time in making sure we understand, um, as the picture becomes clearer, what it means for the Scottish Government and for public bodies, and therefore what it means for us. Um, so we're staying close to government to understand the sorts of um, planning they're able to do at this stage, um, what the, identifies that the areas they've identified as being particularly at risk if there is a crash out of the European Union in 2019, um, the, the sorts of um, preparations they need to make, not so that we can audit that at the moment, because that wouldn't be realistic or fair, but so that if, if it happens, we can respond to it and we can look at the Scottish Government as a whole in the round. The other choices it's having to make about priorities and where it invests skills and time. We'll continue to do that until we've got more clarity on what it means, as we've done with new financial powers. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Bill? Thank you. Uh, just before I move on to the subject, it's interesting scenario. As an auditing <laughs> body, a worst case for others might be a best case for you because you'll get more work and more excitement you know, for the staff and for recruiting. Um, to be honest, at the moment, it feels as though we have plenty of interesting work on the stocks. Um, we've given you a flavour, I hope, in the budget proposal um, that we're well placed for the new financial powers that are being implemented. <laughs> but there's no doubt they are a challenge for us. Yes. They're a stretch for staff. They're requiring everybody to be working at the top of their game. Um, and it's probably worth being clear that we don't have any financial incentive in increasing our workload. Um, we, we can't make a profit. We break even year on year and we recover our costs from Parliament and from the bodies who fund us. So we're grateful for the challenging work, but I don't, don't think we're looking out for more at the moment. Moving then on to um, the issue of quality, where you've asked for an increase. I think you had 100,000 last year, now another 150 to take it up to 250. What does that actually mean? How, how do you spend that money? Where does it go? Sure. Um, members of the Commission will remember that our budget proposal last year um, made mention of the fact that the procurement round that we had been through um, with the firms who we've now appointed for a, an additional five-year period had generated some significant savings for us um, on top of the savings that we've made, the efficiencies that we've made in ways of work across Audit Scotland. Now, that's a good thing for the public purse, but we were very conscious that it also raises the um, risks of audit not being delivered to the quality that's required across the piece. And we recognise the commercial pressures that the firms particularly are operating under. So over the last um, couple of years, we've done a couple of things to mitigate that risk. Um, the first is to um, agree a new audit quality framework, which governs the uh, quality assurance across all of the audit work that's carried out for me and for the Accounts Commission. Um, the second is to put in place independent assurance um, of all of the audit work that's carried out, financial statements work done by the in-house team, which we've had in place in the past, but for the first time, direct assurance on the quality of the audit work done by firms and um, independent assurance rather than peer review assurance of performance audit and best value audit work. 
and the third strand is an enhanced reporting regime that the Commission will see at the end of this financial year in its first developmental stage that provides um, a marshalling of all of the evidence we've got about audit quality and compliance with the standards and the terms of the contract in one place. Um, we're funding that internally through the savings made from the procurement round and from restructuring of the business, um, but we are investing in that because it's hugely important to me and to the Commission, and I know it's been a matter of concern to the Commission here as well, the SCPA. So what does the 250 actually go on? Um, we, ha we had just let a contract in the last two or three weeks um, after a competitive process with ICAS to review every year um, a sample of audits carried out on my behalf and the Accounts Commission's behalf. Um, that's a significant element of it. And um, I would need to check what the... Russell. <laughs> It will be around 60,000 per year. Yeah, I'm trying to get up to 250, if, if, you know, if we can go through the, sure. the main items. Um, so the, the contract is the new element, and we are then restructuring our business to put in place um, a team which is there specifically for audit appointments and assurance um, at arm's length from people delivering audit work in Audit Scotland and elsewhere, um, and responsible for um, doing the in-house elements of the assurance work that's required, um, the relationships with all of the appointed auditors, and the annual reporting that's required across the piece. Um, so that's still unfolding. We're due to review it um, during 2018. Um, that's what we have been um, ring-fencing to invest so far, given the importance of audit quality, and we'll revise that as it moves forward. So I've still got 60 out of 250. Is the rest of it internal staff costs? Diane can help you with the detail. Um, the rest of it is um, staffing costs and a uh, small consultancy budget to help us develop some of the parts of the framework which uh, we still need to develop um, me mechanisms and methodologies around, for example, on taking um, feedback from clients and stakeholders about their perceptions of the quality of audit, which you'll know is a is a very complex area um, and so on. So there's um, a core team, um, there's independent external um, assessment of the quality of audit through ICAS and there's a consultancy budget for the further development work that's required. Did that consultancy? Um, I think the consultancy is around 40,000. And how and many are have, in your team? There are a team of, at the moment, um, three and we'll be bringing uh, an additional full-time equivalent uh, role or roles um, into the mix. That sounds quite an expensive three people then to get your 250. Um, these are the total, um, the total costs, including on costs, for the staff involved. So it's 150,000 for three people, is uh, um, what you're saying? Uh, approximately. That's, that's, that is the uh, 50,000 is around the average full cost mm -hmm. of employing a member of staff and the staff who are involved in uh, audit quality appraisal tend to be at the more senior end of, of the scales because they need to have experience in order to do the job. So are those properly. three people now designated in post, they know who they are? Yes. 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 Okay. Jenny. Okay. Um, can I commend you for the efficiency savings you've already made and indeed the ones I see in, in your budget proposals? Um, I appreciate times are tough, so being able to do that is, is much appreciated by the Commission. Um, you've explained the additional 150,000, so I'm not going to go there again. Um, but the only other kind of um, increase in, in fees was under legal and other professional fees. I think an increase of 10% isn't huge, but I wonder whether you could give your observations on why that is. Diane, do you want to pick that up? Um, I think this is based on the, our understanding of, or anticipation of demands for additional advice in the current climate of a lot of uncertainty and fast moving, um, fast moving policy changes and um, developments and so on. So included in that um, heading are, are um, general consultancy support, um, the potential for legal advice and fees, and also our ability to respond to um, issues or challenges that might emerge in the individual audits of um, bodies. So we um, need to plan 
in budgeting terms to have the capacity and flexibility to respond. We may not always spend in that particular budget heading, but without the resources, we may be constrained from um, seeking the best advice as the year rolls on. We're anticipating um, that there may be more demand for specialist um, technical advice than there perhaps has been in previous years. Thanks very much for that. Um, Some of the reports <coughs> do have a degree of contention in them, one could say. And <coughs> it is open to the Auditor General, and we have to, as a board, make provision for the Auditor General to get legal advice on the appropriate wording in some of these reports from time to time. That's one of the elements we've got to consider. Having seen some of the reports, I appreciate why that might be necessary. Um, could I move you on to just clarify something? If, if we are, or you are, going to be looking at revising the pay award, will that have an impact on what you then do in terms of fees charged? It depends how, how where we end up. As Diana said, it will be a negotiation. Um, we will be working very hard to balance um, what's affordable within our current budget um, with um, the uh, expectations um, and the need to recruit and retain the staff that we need. Um, if we end up in a position where we simply can't reach agreement within the budget that we have here, um, we will look for further efficiencies internally. That gets more difficult every year, as it does for all public bodies, but we will look at that. Um, we'll look at the fee setting for the next audit year, which starts in October 2018. Um, and as a last resort, we have the autumn and spring budget revisions to come back to you. But we work very hard to make sure we never have to do that. We haven't in the past. We'll do our best to make sure we don't in future. So you don't anticipate coming back even before the budget process is over? We, we have no expectation of that at all at the moment. That's helpful to know so that we have certainty in what we consider. Um, now, page 19 notes that audit of fees agreed with audited bodies may be increased by 10%. I understand you used to have a provision where you could decrease audit fees by 10%. Um, did any, any public body receive those reductions in the past? A very small number did, okay. yes, but it, it's it was a very very small number and we had feedback when we did our review of fees and funding from a number of finance directors that said they thought we should not continue with that as a, uh, a regular basis because it, they felt it was very difficult for them generally <laughs> to achieve uh, reductions um, what we have retained though is an annual review process and if the auditor and the audited body believe that fees should be reduced, then they will be, they will be, but it will be a permanent reduction from the start of the next year. Okay. Um, were these finance directors the ones that enjoyed the reductions or the ones that didn't, out of curiosity? I wonder. Probably the ones that didn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised at that. Um, so, so you retain a degree of flexibility to make these reductions, although they're not the, available across the board anymore. Then they're not available on a an individual within year okay. basis, but between years, yes. It okay, is. that's helpful to know. Um, can I turn to health boards because I see um, they will be pleased to see the fee reductions of 4.3% um, as performance costs are going to be met centrally by the Parliament. But island health boards remain at the same level. Could I ask why that is? I mean, I suspect there's an obvious answer to that, but for the record. The, for, for the record, there, there is, uh, and it is that the island health boards had not been paying a contribution to the performance audit costs in recent years. Now, you see, I didn't expect that answer, so it's always good to ask. Can I ask why? Did they just get missed off? It, go, it goes back a, a long time okay. to uh, when um, Audit Scotland was, was formed and judgments were made at the time about the relative burdens on islands versus territorial boards, mainland. Okay. Continuing challenge for us and for small audited bodies that, that um, the, the starting cost of doing an audit isn't very uh, sensitive to the size of the body. Um, so small health boards audit fees proportionally are higher than those for larger boards. And I think that was one of the mechanisms that was used in the past to try and even things out a little bit um, with the funding that's now uh, provided by the Parliament for performance audit that falls away. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I turn to page 21 and um, costing audit work? Because you very helpfully set out 
the hourly rates for audit work, and I, I welcome the transparency um, you have provided, if only other public bodies um, took uh, a leaf out of your book. Um, but can I ask, therefore, do you take the actual cost of staff and hourly rates to inform future fees? Is that how you work out the schedule of future fees? Not quite. Russell will talk you through that. Not, not, not quite, but um, the hourly rates in here are the full cost of uh, running Audit Scotland divided by the number of hours we expect our staff to work on um, audit or other direct activities. So it's, it's, it's an hourly rate based on that. And those then, in effect, are used to... Um, as, as a mechanism to compare the costs, the actual costs, with what we've set as the fees. So, yes, over the long term, you're right. It's, it's an iterative process year on year on year on year. Out, out of curiosity, could you explain to me how you monitor, I suppose the word is productivity of the, the audit staff, you know, how you determine what are the chargeable hours, the direct work, um, and the indirect administration? We have a time recording system okay. which... Uh, in which all staff record the activities on which they are, or individual audits on which they're spending their time. And I look forward to your, for, to your entry for your last occasion <laughs> before committee will be interesting reading. Thank you, convener. Can I just ask, a, a, what, what is the normal utilisation or, you know, chargeable percentage? It varies by grade of staff uh, from around about 135 days for assistant directors, which is the lowest level, uh, up to 200 days for auditors, senior auditors, the, the, the core audit grades. And what's the denominator? Days. No, sorry, I mean so, 135 out of how many? It's about 220. It varies depending on um, different uh, staff with different terms and conditions, but about 220. Worth saying, we are currently reviewing um, our time recording codes. At the moment, we have different codes in different parts of the business, which makes making meaningful comparisons more difficult than it ought to be. Um, and we'll happily update the Commission on that next year. So just to be sure, the, the rates that are quoted on, I think you said page 21, are the charge-out rates? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. Our cost rates equal our charge-out rates because we have no profit. Yes, but if you're, if you're not charging people out for the full number of hours, then you're not recovering all your cost. We are because the full costs go in at the top of the, calcu of the calculation. It's the full costs of Audit Scotland that go in at the top, minus the cost of firms, um, minus one or two other things. You've then got that pool of cost, which is divided by the number of days that staff work. So this is a very full, costed, full costing rate. But if you're if you if you're dividing it by two hundred and twenty, but then only multiplying it by two hundred, am I missing something here? You're missing the overhead that has to be spread across all of the chargeable hours in inverted commas um, that staff deliver. Mm -hmm. So you don't charge them. Sorry, forgive it, me a second. So the charge out rates here. Yes. Are the total costs of employment. The total cost, the cost of the organisation. Of the, of yep. the, ah, okay. Yes. Total cost of audit Scotland. For a trainee is £46 an hour. Are we looking at the same thing? Yes. We are looking yes. at the same thing. I think the confusion comes where you start talking about charge-out rates because we're, we're not charging staff out in that way. So these are the, the hourly rates that are required to recover the costs of Audit Scotland against the um, hours of audit delivery that are done. It's, it's a different business model okay. to a firm where you're looking to generate more chargeable hours to so generate is the, a profit. So it's for people to work effectively? There are many incentives for people <clears> to work effectively, but um, the, the uh, chargeable hours um, isn't, uh, isn't the most important one of them. Because you get paid for their hours regardless of how hard they work? Because we're not in a, the incentives that we have are not about generating additional work. They're about doing the work to the highest quality that we can as efficiently as we can. Is that set out somewhere else to save time here? 
Um, it, I'm trying to think where the, our fees and funding strategy might might be the best. <coughs> Thinking way of more of staff incentives. Yes, Diane, do you want to have a go? Um, I, th I think that the piece of work that Caroline referred to, we're currently reviewing how we use our time. There's a project going on which is looking <laughs> in uh, a quite granular detail at all of the time coding, time recording and so on. And we're developing enhanced um, models for the incentives to deliver a quality piece of work um, and so on. I'd be very happy to uh, to share that with you when the, the work is complete and to um, to give you a briefing at some point on that piece of work and, and how that looks. I think the key thing, as, um, as the Auditor General has mentioned a couple of times, is in this public audit model, this is quite a, a, a different set of incentives and, and different starting point from a profit maximisation one. Assurance that a huge amount of management effort goes into comparing the time that's going into a particular audit and the grade mix, the cost of delivering the audit against the audit fee, benchmarking that across other audits internally and against the um, cost of the audits that are done by firms. I don't want to give the impression there are no incentives for efficiency in that way, but the incentives aren't about profit. Optimization, I think, of just yeah. efficiency of, yeah. of time. Um, as an additional um, check and balance, we're currently doing a review of the first year of the implementation of best val the new best value model in local government. And part of that feedback to the Accounts Commission will be um, not just about the, the work, the content and the quality, but also about the cost of the, the, the work that we've done. I've, I've got a few questions myself, but I'd like to invite my fellow members if they've got any other questions they'd like to ask at this point. In that case, um, obviously, Audit Scotland is taking on additional audit functions as a result of the devolved powers. Logically, you would think that if Audit Scotland is taking on part of that audit, that there must be savings to the Scottish Government elsewhere, since that audit function will no longer be carried out by another body. Is there any saving there that we can point to? It's difficult to do that across the Scottish Government and the UK Government because of the way in which the most significant of the new financial powers are being delivered. Um, so for income tax and for VAT, they will continue to be collected by HMRC um, as part of their overall collection systems, and our colleagues in the National Audit Office will continue to, to, to audit um, HMRC um, in terms of their overall management and those two tax accounts. If anything, I think um, my counterpart, the Comptroller and Auditor General in Westminster, would argue that there's more work involved for them in the additional assurance that's required around Scottish income tax rather than less. Um, and of course, the Scottish Parliament is looking for its own assurance on Scottish revenues, which are now a very significant part of the Scottish budget. The same is true to a lesser extent for the Department for Work and Pensions, certainly during the transitional period, um, when we are fully up and running with the new Social Security Agency and the new benefits in place. Um, it may be appropriate to have a look at the degree of interaction with DWP, um, but I think the expectation is that because the universal credit will continue to be a UK-wide budget uh, benefit, which will interact with many others, that that interface will still be there. Um, we're very happy to keep that under review, um, and it's one of the commitments we've made to the Public Audit Committee, as you've been talking about um, accountability and assurance over the new powers, but at the moment it's not easy to see where there's a reduction elsewhere um, to compensate for the increase required here in Scotland. And from what you touched on there, page 7 of your budget proposal, the very top line says that the Scottish Parliament will be responsible for raising income of £22 billion. Of course, the Scottish Parliament isn't actually responsible for raising it. It's raised by the UK government and then allocated back, which is why there's an issue about savings on uh, audit. You're right. Um, we're moving from about four, £4 billion pounds being um, uh, revenue which forms part of the Scottish budget other than the block grant to £22 billion other than the block grant, about 50%. Um, as you know, the fiscal framework is complex and so are the administration arrangements. Um, the Parliament um, 
rightly expects assurance about the way that's working and about the way in which Scotland's interests are being protected as part of that. Um, and there will be an equal and equivalent interest, I imagine, in Westminster about the other side of that equation. Um, it's one of the, the, the costs of devolving financial responsibility is the need to increase the oversight and scrutiny of which we're a small part. I've got one or two um, small points I'd just like to ask about. You're obviously talking about real-term fee reductions, and you're talking about that happening in 2018-19, and you have a history of fee reductions going back over a number of years now. In the present environment, I realise that the, the fee collection is really a totally separate you know, calculation, but is there not a, a danger of perceptions that costs are being transferred to the Scottish Government from the audited unit, units by giving them reduced fees? No, we've worked very hard, as the Commission knows, to increase transparency, first of all, um, and you'll see within this budget proposal a sectoral breakdown um, of where the costs and the recovery lie. Um, we follow that through to our financial reporting each year, um, and um, we are also very clear about uh, the uh, functions which we ask Parliament to fund primarily because we're not able to charge an audit fee for them. Um, so there's no uh, question of that happening at all, and I hope the increased transparency provides the Commission with that assurance. And looking at page 9, GDP deflators, um, you're using a GDP deflator of 1.6%, which of course is what is officially out there. How are you going to be affected with increased inflation? You can see within the budget proposal the assumptions we've made about inflation, um, and we need to keep those under review since things are changing out there. The way we use deflators in this proposal is really to give you a real terms comparison. So looking back the way it doesn't make a significant difference. What's more important is the assumptions that we build into future budgets and making sure that they're realistic um, and as far as we can that they're offset by efficiencies that we're able to make across the business. Now you've spoken about efficiency savings and uh, £187,000 is what you're planning which is 28% of the uh, estimated cost of the new uh, the cost of the new powers. How realistic is that? Where is it coming from? They're well planned as part of the budget, and I'll ask Diane to talk you through the makeup of them. Um, <clears throat> the efficiencies come from, uh, um, as I said in response to an earlier question, um, how we have built up the. Um, the work that's required for the new financial powers, <laughs> along with refocusing some of the work that is that is taking place in um, central government and associated bodies um, already through the audit. So there's a bit of refocusing going on um, to deliver efficiencies to contribute to the new financial powers work. And we also continue to um, generate um, and look for efficiencies in our use of IT to support the audit. So I mentioned earlier how we've um, developed our audit intelligence project, which looks at data analytics to equip auditors um, with um, easily accessible um, data and to analyse data more efficiently and so on. So, the, uh, so the, those are the primary makeup of those efficiencies. We also have a separate um, programme of efficiencies and the, the biggest piece of work we've got going on is the one about how we use our time uh, that, that we've discussed in response to the earlier answer and we'd be very happy to share the results of that when that work's complete. I mean the IT side you're talking about really uh, enhan enhancement of what you've got in order to achieve savings down the line so there must be an initial investment in there to achieve that. Uh, there is we we've um, we've already made an investment and w in uh, some of the um, capital requirements and others that we have to deliver data analytics and I mentioned the um, data analytics staff the learning and development that we're doing so there's there's a range of ways in which we're investing in that capacity and that's a very that's a key priority for us we've taken our digital strategy uh, to the board and had recent discussions about how we um, both um, deploy did auditing in digital um, activities in the public sector but also how we build our own digital capacity so that's very much at the forefront of our development strategy. Okay, turning to Appendix 3, page 17, um, point 2, 
Um, we're talking about uh, the audit work done for the different classes of audits and so on. And we've obviously had, a, over the years, had quite a bit of discussion on this in the past to ensure there's no, uh, you know, cross subsidy and so on. And I think a lot of work's been done on that. You've determined that each sector as being a class of audits. Maybe you could remind us a little bit, especially as we've got new members on the board, how that works in terms of uh, establishing uh, a sector as a class of audit. Yeah. Um, under the uh, PFA Act 2000, uh, Audit Scotland is required to uh, try to broadly break even taking one year with another <laughs> for either audits or classes of audits. And early on in Audit Scotland's um, life, the uh, board decided that classes of audit was the way in which they wanted to go forward. Uh, and we have defined classes of audit as being each sector. So local government is a class, the NHS, uh, central government chargeable audits, further education, and Scottish Water sits on its own. Can I ask a question? Yeah, Are please. there any Chinese walls in the organisation? In relation to audit quality, yeah. yes, there are. Just generally, I mean, as a... Um, beyond that, beyond no. That, no. Um, as Diane said earlier, one of the strengths of our public audit model in Scotland is that we can look um, across local government, the NHS central government, and top from top to bottom from uh, central government funding right through to where it's spent on the ground, and we aim to maximise that rather than to put artificial divisions within it. And the one you mentioned then? Quality. Audit quality. Yeah. Yes, the team that we discussed earlier that is doing the uh, quality appraisal work, they are separate from the audit delivery teams. So how does that does that work? And is this physical files, software, uh, computer files? How, how do you keep them apart? They, those st members of staff do not work on any audits. They have their own uh, file areas within, uh, within software, within, within the computer systems. They will report to Diane rather than to any of the uh, directors engaged in, in audit work. Sorry. Uh, still staying on the same page, uh, item four, just out of curiosity, this is the first time I've seen the, this comment made, audit appointments are made by the Auditor General or the Accounts Commission. I thought the Auditor General uh, appointed all auditors. The Accounts Commission um, makes appointments to all local government bodies. Yeah. That's its primary function. Who does the selection process? Uh, we run a, a shared procurement exercise yeah. um, which uh, makes, uh, puts together a procurement strategy, puts together a slate of um, audited bodies who have successfully tendered for the work and then proposes portfolio that make up the individual appointments for me to approve for the bodies in my area mm -hmm. and for the Accounts Commission to approve for the bodies in its area. The criteria for appointing these auditors the same as Audit Scotland uses elsewhere within the public sector? We, we run an overall single joined up procurement exercise on behalf of the Accounts Commission and me as Auditor General. So there's no difference in terms of the criteria in choosing the auditor? No. Okay. Uh, I'm almost there. Just, just one bit of interest here on page 19, uh, item 18. The best value in housing benefit audit it's a portion between the 32 councils on the basis of populations. Is that as of June 2015? Yes. I would just wonder what the what the reason behind using that criteria was. It's a population is a crude measure of complexity of an audit of a council, surely. It, it is, and it is not meant to reflect the uh, relative costs of the individual audits. What it reflects is the way in which the bodies who are being charged were funded for it by the Scottish Government when that work started. So when Best Value Audit started, the um, amount of money distributed to local government to compensate them for the additional cost of both yeah. Best Value work for themselves and audit was just put through the main distribution formula for 
uh, local authorities, it wasn't divided up on the basis of what the, the actual costs might be. And therefore, we have kept that mechanism uh, in place so that the bodies are paying approximately equal to the relative funding that they received from Scottish Government. Okay, it's just interesting. Do any other members have any questions they would like to ask at this point? No? In that case, can I thank the witnesses for their evidence and attendance today, especially Russell, who's uh, presumably rushing off now for a, a well-earned rest. <laughs> Once again, very good, very good uh, luck in your retirement. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, and I move the meeting into uh, private.